Today's episode, a call to trainers and coaches out there. We brought on one of the best trainer of trainers, Jason Phillips. We have an incredible discussion about the state of the fitness industry and how trainers and coaches can truly learn to be successful in this very challenging industry. We know you're going to love this episode. Today's program giveaway is the Hard Gainer Bundle. This is a great bundle of programs for those of you that find it tough to pack on muscle and strength, or if you have a really slow lagging metabolism that just doesn't want to speed up. This bundle we're going to give away for free, but you have to enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now we are also running a sale right now. That same bundle, the Hard Gainer bundle is 50% off. And then we also have MAPS bands on sale, 50% off. If you're interested in either one, click on the link at the top of the description below. One other thing, uh, Jason Phillips agreed to give away all his content from NCI to one lucky winner. So one of you will win all of NCI's content. You'll get access to all of it for free but you have to enter to win that. So if you're interested, go to ncimindpump.com forward slash October dash scholarship. All right, here comes the show. Off air, we were talking about, you're saying how you feel like the space is going to get regulated. Yep. Uh, that, yeah. So w talk about that a little bit. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, I think that, first of all, on the, I don't think it's going to be like a education based regulation. Like, I don't think they're going to come in and be like, where's your college degree, blah, blah, blah. Like because, standards. Yeah. Okay. Because there's just so many loopholes there. There's so much gray area. Okay. I'm quote unquote giving advice, et cetera. But when we start looking at like the advertising and marketing space, that's where it really starts to come in, right? Like that's when, if you say on a Facebook ad, this program will make you $10,000. You're implying that if somebody purchases, they do the work, they'll make the $10,000. Right. And if that doesn't hold up to be true, or if you don't have anything to back that up, if you haven't personally achieved it uh, more often than it's failed, then you can't really make that statement, right? It's no longer a true statement. So you're talking about the space where uh, people are teaching you how to build a business or make money advertising or using your methods. That's That space has existed Forever. For a long time. Yeah. I remember as a kid, <laughs> I bought a few of these as a kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was Bro, I'd guy. be embarrassed to tell you the first product. Listen, who's who's well, the I, guy on the boat? Hold on. I bought Dom. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, wait, wait. I'm going to tell, tell you two that I bought, and we'll see if you – well, you're younger than I am, but we'll, we'll see if you remember. Don LaPree was one of them. Uh, you placed tiny little ads in newspapers across the – whatever. It was this whole method. And then the other one was Tom Vu. He was this. Oh, Tom Vu's <laughs> the boat guy. Is. Tom Vu. He I was remember this, that name. Yeah, he was this 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 immigrant <laughs> Asian dude, and he was on a yacht. And he's like, "Look at me, beautiful women. Yeah, I make yeah. lots of money." And he probably like, sold the same product that I bought, which was like coffee shop millionaire. Yeah, <laughs> it was like uh, you ever noticed that all the guys they show up to a coffee shop in a Ferrari, yeah. and all they do is they sit there on their laptop. It's yeah. because they're making money from their laptop. But I was like. I want to make money for my life. <laughs> like, so cool. This is great. Yeah. Actually, I, I swear to God, if you went into my Gmail right now, I'm almost positive there's a folder that says Coffee Shop Millionaire because I like put Reels? all of the shit from that product. In oh there. my God. Doug, put, look up Tom Look up Tom Vu. Tom Vu uh, ad. Yeah, how Dude, to make money or whatever yeah. on, a, on a yacht. You got to see ended this guy. Up, uh, we ended up in the long run meeting the guy that helped him build that funnel. Really? He's like, coffee shop millionaire. He's like, I fucking knew that product. And like the guy was connected to like Rich Sheffrin and like he was a part of it. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, dude. wow. I'm like, this, this is so incestuous. It's wow. ridiculous. So do you think, so you think this is going to be general over all like, like basically yeah, all internet anything, marketing, anything, not anything just fitness? Said, no, no, no. It's, it's a hundred percent not fitness. Fitness would be the last, I think. Okay. Yeah. Cause this um, space exists for everything. Real yes. estate, yeah, finance, yeah. Uh, so tech. I think we would call it like the expert space. Okay. Right? Cause so now, like anybody like claiming, yeah, the guru and experts. Now, was it not regulated would, before? Cause like no. I said, it's been around for a long time. I mean, technically, yes. Um, I don't. Look, look at Tom Vu and his Tom Vu and his babe. His the title of it. I bought this. Uh, this so is it, not it. And I would always show these dudes, you know, and they'd show their paycheck. So there's the proof. There, there he is, is right there. The knowledge you will learn at my seminar will make you financially independent for the rest of your life. One of my recent transactions, I walked away with a check for fifteen thousand ten dollars and fifty cents on a yacht. <laughs> I come to this country. Look at me, beautiful women. He Lots of money. And I bought it. He probably killed it. I was yeah. like 15 years old. Oh, yeah. oh, he, he went to jail. Oh, did he go to jail? Yeah, he did. For what? 
I think ripping people off. <laughs> exactly. It's been Surprise. going on for 10 years. <laughs> did he really, did he, see, look up how much he, how, uh, like what is jail time and what happened to yeah. him? Cause I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know he went to jail. Oh yeah, dude. He got busted for fraud. So that's so, so I'm saying the regulations existed, but you think they're going to make, cause the internet changed the game. Yep. It totally. And so what do you think they're going to, they're going to come down with? He's actually never formally charged. Wow. Yeah. So he's free to go. Oh, yeah. I'm wrong. See? My bad. Oh. All right. We'll look him up later and see how he did it. <laughs> <laughs> how did he get away with that? So, you know? yeah. Do you think it's going to be around the, like, the. I don't, I don't know how they're going to impose it. And I don't know what's triggered the companies that have, quote unquote, gone through it. Because I, I know firsthand at least two companies that have gone through it. Um, very large companies, multiple, multiple, multiple eight figure companies. So I don't know. I don't know what triggered it. Um, I know one of them, the claims that were being made were just egregious. Yeah. Like they were so outlandish that, um, you know, something happened, but you know, we, uh, I think that being in business at some point, you're going to have people that just, they, like, we've had people that they want like a $5,000 refund. And we're just like, listen, like it has nothing to do with the $5,000, but if we do it for you, all of a sudden it opens up the doors and we got to do it for a lot of people. Like the policies are the policies. Like, we will try to get you fifty thousand dollars in value. Like we want to help you, but like we're trying to stay on a policy. Yeah. Like oh, I'm gonna fucking go to like Better Business Bureau, and I'm and we're just like really like this is where it's going. So like I think at some point every business has that customer. Um, I don't know what triggers the FTC right now, but I know they're watching. What like, remind what it reminds me of is because the fitness space has done this for a long time. Well, they'll show or supplement space. Yep. Well, they'll show some really crazy before and after yep. yeah and people then will be led to believe like oh if i take that supplement or if right. i hire that trainer like hydroxy cut yeah, yeah and, yeah. and then it doesn't happen and the way that they've been regulated is you have to put like a, this does you know this, this is, is not a disclaimer on there. exactly so i'm wondering so you're starting to see that now okay, yeah. in in digital shit so i do this thing on, on webinars all the time where like uh, in the very beginning i'll intro myself and i'll be like by the way if you haven't already been able to figure it out i'm pretty much a fucking lunatic and that absolutely nothing i say should be taken seriously <laughs> and, like, and so I'm like, so I'm like, you know, I'm going to talk about these millions of dollars I've made that I've absolutely made, but like, don't take my journey there very seriously because I'm not saying that your journey should look like mine. Like right. mine's fucked. And like, so I say it that way where I'm doing the disclaimer, but I say it in a way that's very conversational Yeah, mm. that's being done in every webinar now. Yeah. And everybody's figured out a way like Frank Kern. I know he had some shit, dude. He's very careful now. Um, yeah. I feel like, um, First off, the the burden is always on the consumer, but we already have laws to protect against fraud. And I think those those laws are still okay. Like if I sell a product and say you are guaranteed, right. well then yeah, now now I've now well, I'm so, liable. So where's the so where's the middle ground though? Because let's say somebody buys maps. Yeah. Right? And yep. you say, here's the results associated with maps, right? And you're yeah. not saying guaranteed if you do this, you're gonna get that, right? right? You, but so they're like, Well, I changed my diet, right? Right. Uh, and I went and I did these exercises every day. And they did them at like 50% effort and yeah. they walked through the gym. They talked on their phone while they were doing them, but they quote unquote did the program, mm -hmm. right? How are we drawing that line? You, well, so yeah. you used, you, I'm well, glad you, you also, used, you use an example of what we didn't do because that's like, this is our Achilles heel of why we haven't scaled it ridiculous numbers. But I think that that's, I think that you're smart because yeah. it's authentic. Yeah, well, it's coming it was, from other people. I was just going to say. I feel smart now because you're telling us this because I mean, that no, it's but going I, that I way. Think it's, I actually think that you're, you've done it the right way. And there's a, the, I tell people are like, what's the guarantee on your product? And I was like, the guarantee is if you do the work, you'll get a result. And if you're looking for a guarantee today that says like, if you buy this, you'll make $10,000. I'm probably not the guy for you because you're trying to bet on me more than you're trying to bet on you. And I've already made my fucking money. You mm -hmm. still need to. That's a hundred percent. So yeah. I'm glad you used our programs as an example, because one thing that we, and I know you did the same thing, Jason, because you, before you did this business, you coach people for a long time. Yep. And this is what separates, uh, I think influencers, quote unquote influencers from people who've actually done it. Yep. You, we learned as trainers relatively quickly one of the biggest mistakes you can make as a trainer that will crush your business where you will fail is you overpromise and underdeliver. One of the best things you could do is underpromise. Yep. So I would actually always set people up for expectations that were terribly low. Yeah. And that that would set them up for success. And so that's what we often do. In fact, when we talk about coaches being a trainer and being a coach on the show, we never glamorize it. And so we're always surprised, almost surprised. When people call in and say, I became a trainer because I listened to your show. I was like, God, we tell people what a tough <laughs> like, job really? it is, yeah. how, how much you're going to fail, how much it sucks. You don't make a lot of money. But I think it's because uh, we we under promise and people hear the authenticity. So I'm glad to use this as an example. What do you think leads that? Do you think that like, 
you you do your first like ad where you give like somewhat of a guarantee or your transformation. This person was here now they're here or they made this much money. Now they make this much money. And then you see like great return and then you just start getting crazier. Yeah, it's easy. Is that, Absolutely. Is that's how it yeah, has I think it's just like a greed thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, uh, obviously good friends with Alex Ormosi, right? And Alex puts this book out, $100 million uh, offers. And in the offer, or in the value equation that the whole book is basically predicated on, he talks about you have to have a guarantee, right? Or he basically says, he talks about likelihood of achievement. Right. He says the way that you increase likelihood of achievement is you add a guarantee to it. And so now, I mean, there are some fucking outlandish guarantees where yeah. I'm a believer that every time the market trends towards something, if you really want to win, you need to trend away from it. Which is why, like now, like when I teach, I'm like, I don't think you need a guarantee. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that if you're a product today, you know, we're recording this what September in 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a product, you're just coming out. Putting a guarantee out there tells every consumer that you're just like everything out there. Because mm -hmm. what they're hearing right now is like, well, I'll coach you for six months, and if we don't hit your result, I'll keep coaching you for free. Right. Or like, if you buy my year long program, I guarantee you'll lose this, or I'll keep coaching you for free. Because like, what else can you guarantee? Like, if you're a coach, you're not going to give somebody their money back. You can't guarantee their work ethic. It's it's so hard to do it. So the only real guarantee there is like, we'll we'll do this, you know, or I'll keep coaching you, or I'll give you access. And so the guarantees are all the fucking same. Well. Now you might as well be the same price. You might as well be the same service. The only thing you're differentiating on now is the person. Yeah. Well, that's a liability in and of itself because how the fuck can you scale that? Yeah. How can you scale you? You can't. Your time and energy are done. Um, I, also, so I, I, I also think the guarantee model too is just a, like a, it's a quick fix or a Band-Aid for, a, a, for someone who's trying to scale or build a business because ultimately – you might you might convince 10 people faster because you have this guarantee or transformation example of somebody but if i actually t take one person and fundamentally change their business or change their life we're talking about training that person is going to go talk to people for the rest of their life about yep. me. Yep. It's just going to take a lot longer to to catch up to the leads that yep. the person who just guaranteed a bunch of stuff. But the good news, and this is what I think would happen with maps was it was that very slow process, but that compounds. And then mm -hmm. once you've helped millions of people, you've got millions of people that are constantly talking about how much that you change your life. And I don't have to guarantee mm -hmm. anything. They're going to go do the, they're going to go do the guarantee for you without you even having to say it. It's interesting. Like, as I'm hearing you say that, I'm thinking just about speed, right? Speed is the only thing I'm thinking about. And I'm thinking you guys, in your words, you think maps was like slow-ish, right? Um, like grand scheme of things, still pretty quick. Like you guys built a lot, of, a really big business relatively quickly. Um, but for the current marketplace, people would think about it as slow. Um, I think speed could, you could eliminate the word speed and you could just say stress, right? Mm -hmm. So the faster you go, the more stress you're going to have. Totally. But I don't think about it just as physiological stress. I think about it as physical stress too. So like you take the company and you like you envision it as a physical thing and you apply force, you apply load, right? That's stress yeah. to the infrastructure. The faster you go, the increase, you're, you're just increasing that stress. You're increasing that load. And most people in a brand new company, what don't they have? They don't have infrastructure. Right. Yeah. They have no support. They totally. can't fucking do mm -hmm. it. So it's like, all right, well, let's just magically say that the guarantee was the proverbial opening of the floodgates. All of a sudden, you open up the floodgates, you bring people in, you're not going to hit your guarantee yep. because your infrastructure is going to be so bad. And I think that there's a whole different conversation. We can definitely go into it. I think what people have been pursuing the last four years is wrong. And I think that, you know, I'll take my part in this because I was one of the first coaches in the space to hit multiple seven figures. Um what I didn't talk about enough was like the margins at multiple seven figures. So like at my peak in you know, 2020, when we sold the coaching business, it was, I think it was generating like 3 million ish per year. Um, and I think that the margins on that were 33%. So let's just say I was taking home a million dollars a year. It's about pretty mm -hmm. accurate, right? I guarantee you today, if I were to rebuild, I would go a little slower. I would get the company to like one, five, one, six, and it'd still take home a million dollars. Right. And there's 1.5 of top line that I'll leave on the table, but that's 1.5 of stress that I'm never going to have to deal with. And I think a lot of coaches, they see what I've done. They see what some of these other coaching companies have done. And the only thing that's thrown around in the digital space is top line revenue. Yep. Nobody talks about take home. And so like I asked my coaches recently, this is what we started doing in our quarterly planning. I, we go into the quarter and I say, all right, first question, what do you want to take home next quarter? And I mean, I get looked at like a deer in fucking headlights. <laughs> and I'm like, you're running a business. You're the CEO of a business. You have a team working for you. You know, they're in, they're in this group with me because they're all doing a certain revenue level. And it's like, you don't know what you want to fucking make. That's scary. And then it's like, 
cool. How do we know how much we should produce top line? Because those two should be directly correlated, right? Mm -hmm. We should know top line, let's just say 100K a month produces, you know, post-tax 30K take home. And they're like, well, I don't know. I just want to make more. And I'm like, well, what's more? And when is that enough? And at, at what point is this business not serving that enough? And like, that's where I think so many mistakes are being made. I, really, I, re I remember really learning about the supplement industry that way. A good friend of ours, uh, very successful, communicated to us that a very successful supplement company would have maybe a 10 to 15% margin. Yeah. And it blew my mind because yeah. you're talking about a $10 million yeah. company making a million bucks. Yeah. So the thing about all the employees, all the infrastructure, all the, and the warehouse and the stress. And I thought, wow, that's not worth it. <laughs> that's not worth it. Most, you know, most online coaches would make more money themselves. They would take home more money if they stopped trying to A, grow fast and B, scale out of proportion. I mean, I think feasibly you could get to 3 million and I think you can maintain 40 to 45% margin. I'd be hard pressed to see companies that do more than that. And I mean, Maybe if the person is an influencer and there's no acquisition costs associated with it, but you have to look at the fulfillment cost, which fulfillment alone at scale is probably going to take up close to 50% of margin. I mean, yeah. when you guys were trainers and clubs, you know, even after you paid out, like, because of what people make like 40% yeah. right in a yeah. club, but then you pay like the admin associated with that, That's the right. billing, the processing, like you're getting the 50% margin just on cogs, yep. right? Then you look at like the OPEX of the business, you're probably looking 20 to 30%. Mm -hmm. Like right there, we're already down to like 70%. Now we got to tax that 30% take home at, let's call it 20%, right? And now we're down to, I mean, fucking 20% margin. I really believe this has been perpetuated by the startup culture. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've had the opportunity, Doug and I joined this uh, Hampton group, which is uh, a bunch of really, really successful uh, founders uh, in mostly in the Silicon Valley, although they're all over the, all over the country. Um, and I really was insecure going into it because yeah. like my peers, the, the, my group of 12 people that I work in my life and Doug and I are in different groups. Like, you're talking about guys that have exited hundred million dollar companies. They're on their third or fourth. They sold for just like big fish. And then I actually get an opportunity to hear them break down their business. And it's like that culture is so geared around growth, grow, yeah, grow, grow, hacking. spend everything you can just acquisition and then just prove that you can grow at a fast enough rate and then sell before you've even made any money. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. a lot of these guys can say things like, oh yeah, I built a hundred million dollar company. Well, how much did you make? Oh, I didn't really make anything. I yeah. still have a percentage of that business or right. what like that, or, you know, or I'm like, well, I don't understand. And they're like, well, that's, and then I learned like that culture and what they do. And they it's just like, live on leverage. Yes. Yeah. All leverage. They all, they all live on leverage. And I think we're seeing that culture bleed into even small fitness well, businesses like ours. One of the biggest problems mm -hmm. in our world, in our world in general, not just online marketers, not just online coaches is that people are trying to live on leverage. Right. People are, and I, I'm a big believer you need leverage to grow. Right. So like, uh, the book, the almanac of Naval, right. Naval Ravikant, founder of angel list, like talks about four sources of leverage and how you need leverage to grow. And so I think that you need to understand leverage, but I think most people are over leveraged. Um, they've over leveraged themselves, their, their resources, right there. I mean, everybody's got these mortgages they can barely fucking afford the car payments they can barely afford. And it's like, my opinion is if you can't build a company that profits, then stop worrying about leverage until you can do that. At least that. So Yes and no. In in our space, one million percent yes. Yeah, that's what I'm referring okay. to. Yeah, in our that's space, what I'm talking about. hundred yes. percent agreement. Yeah, in general, I mean, companies like Google, Facebook, like no, no, no. They need they need right. leverage. Companies different. Yeah, the yeah, cost of R and D is insane, and all that. Well, stuff. I mean, if you're not profitable, the very first client you take on, and you don't maintain profit the rest of your career in our space, you yeah. fucked up. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I, I get people all the time. They're like, well, how do where do I get the startup capital? And I'm like, you fucking drive Uber. <laughs> like you drive Uber, you do DoorDash, like you fucking wait tables. Like you go put cash yeah. away, you invest in yourself, you learn the skills, you get really good at the skills, you deliver them for free until you have enough people that believe in your services and then you monetize your services. Yeah. The, the other thing I want to touch on too, Jason, because you said earlier and it, and we kind of glazed over it, but this is a really important thing to, I think, focus on. You said when the market is going one way, going the other way. Yep. Okay. In our market, in the fitness market, there's... So many false promises, so many guarantees that now not being the one or being the one that doesn't do that makes you appear authentic. Oh, everybody else is showing these crazy before and afters. This guy over here says it's going to take me a lot longer. Yep. I think I believe him. I think that says more about the state of our industry than anything else in I the agree. sense that we're now, because the fitness industry at large 
is not a, it's not a super old industry. It really isn't. It's right. really only been a huge industry for maybe a few decades. We're getting to the point now where, uh, I mean, look what happened to the Western medicine or, or the medical industry. Yeah. COVID, the, the trust that people have yeah. in Western medicine declined tremendously because of the way we handled the pandemic. We're, in my opinion, heading down a dark path with the fitness space where pretty soon people aren't going to believe well, anybody says in our space. It's funny that you mention that because I actually think that the COVID boom of digital fitness is what's causing the a lot of the lack of trust today, like, yeah. like current day, September 2023. I think that, listen, NCI benefited tremendously. We had a lot of people that were like, man, I hate my fucking job. I want to be part of this yeah. like anti-government, like anti-Western medicine movement. I want to learn the right way of doing it. Um, and then they saw this option where it's like, wow, I don't have to go to the office. I can make a lot of money right. online. And so people, you know, you saw two people, uh, one person that went in and was like, I really want to learn the skill sets of, of being a successful coach of like being able to deliver a result that is not traditional mm -hmm. Western medicine. And then you saw people that are like, I want to get rich quick. And right now, as we sit here, the space is so inundated. It's so saturated. It's so crowded with uh, I'm going to effectively call them shitheads. Right. And, <laughs> but it's, it's people that just like, took the leap. Like they went in, they're like, oh, I'm going to be an online coach with the intent of making money. Yeah. And, and I don't, I mean, none of us like in this room, we've all built success in the fitness space. I I'll speak for myself, but I'll, I think that you guys are on board. I didn't start my first job as a personal trainer at Gold's Gym in you know Fairfax, Virginia. Because you thought you'd get rich. <laughs> because I thought I was going to be a multimillionaire, right? Like no. I didn't go in. I was like, wow, this is the fucking key that's going to unlock my life. I did it because I was a former anorexic, because health and fitness changed my life, because I was passionate about being in that setting every day, yeah. loving what I was doing, and I enjoyed working with people. And it served me all the way through, man. I built my online business slower than everybody. I built bigger than everybody. I built more sustainable than everybody. But you know, if you look speed wise, man, I was I was slow, dude. It took me it's, 10 plus years. To, it's funny to you point that out because think about that, how different it was for the four of us when we first started, like guaranteed <clears throat> 15 years ago or 20 years ago, if you looked at and you, before Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff, right? And you looked at the landscape of a gym and trainers, none of us knew a rich trainer. I didn't no. know any rich. No. I knew I knew buff trainers. Yeah, you know I knew I knew cool like cool. That funny. was the but that was like the thing was to be the buff trainer. Yeah, right? to be yeah, buff or to have the, the autonomy of sitting yeah. and getting to work in that atmosphere. There was no rich trainers. Right. None. I didn't know one trainer driving a Lambo. I didn't know one trainer balling out with chains and watches. None of that. That didn't right. exist. So nobody who entered 15, 20 years ago really had that thought in mind. Where now in these this internet and social media space the, some of the most financially successful trainers are the ones that are showing off all of these things that they have and so you're getting a whole new wave of young kids that are getting into the space with that in mind and it's so not realistic I, so half so i have a lot of uh, family like uh, cousins i should say that are right, right around my age and we're always talking business and investments and stuff and they're all either in tech or in finance. Yeah. And the joke always is like, man, if I wanted to make money, I should have gotten to one of your guys' spaces because I could be mid-range finance and make right. more money than yeah. I am. Yeah. You know, running the top one of the top fitness podcasts, yep. you know, businesses in the world. Getting into fitness to make money is in my opinion is a losing strategy. Not because you can't make money, you can, but because if you don't have the passion, if you don't if you wouldn't do this for free, you're not going to survive. That's 100%. By I the agree. way, that's the history of the fitness space. I, I use this example all the time. I remember when this first happened. I remember when there was a fitness franchise that took the gym industry by storm in the late 90s, early 2000s, Curves, oh, yeah. exploded. I remember walking into a Curves to try and figure out what was going on, meeting the owner, realizing they had no fitness background. They had no business being a fitness. They said they did it because they saw it was a top franchise, and then I knew this is going to collapse, and sure yeah. enough, or like, but just so you know, you just that that hasn't changed it, it still today. That was yes. my experience Whoa. at Orange Theory. Uh, I was meeting all these people that were opening these gyms. None of them had fitness backgrounds. Yeah. They were yeah. all smart investor people who have been successful in other avenues. Yeah. They saw the growth of the franchise. Oh, I'll buy one. I'll be one. And it's like with no 
real knowledge of this. I won't say which one, but there's a there's a pretty well known uh, boot camp franchise that when they started, they boot they they bootstrapped with like former trainers, former, and they were like, hey, this is how you should brand your boot camp. They fucking blew up. All of a sudden, they were like, well, we should turn this to a biz op. We should go to successful people, like you just said, and that began like the demise of that company. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's funny though because I think back to the first time I made quote unquote, a lot of money being a personal trainer. I was living in LA, dude, I was hustling. Like my day was, I was in the facility at five 30. My first client was six. So like I do like 30 minutes of admin work. I went six to noon, straight clients, little lunch, uh, went downtown LA, got my own workout in, came back. I did like admin work till like four 30, trained more clients till seven 30, wrapped up admin work till eight 30, got home, took a nap, woke up, did like more paperwork from like 1230 to 130, yeah. went back to bed, did it all again. Right. So I had the job where I was like, thing. I was the GM of the gym and I was the, you know, did the most floor hours of, of anybody in the space. And so when I saw the marketing messages of the gurus back then, it was, Hey, you're really good at what you do. You help a lot of people, but you're running out of hours to make more money. Like, here's how I can help you make more money. That was the marketing message of the gurus back in the day, right? That was the mastermind message. If you go to the mastermind message today, it's like, hey, fitness is super lucrative. Make lots of fucking money. Like, here's how you can become a highly paid trainer. Hmm. And it's like, that's very different. Yep. That's yeah. extremely different because the first message assumed that you had passion for what you did. It assumed that you were good at what you did. Hmm. And I think that the barrier to getting in now is so fucking low. Being good at what you do is almost an afterthought. And I've, I've heard, and I don't know this to be true, but I know it to be pretty close to true. I've heard there are certain like business coaches out there that in their program are telling people, don't go get certified. Don't go through an education. Wow. Just use this set of guidelines and give them to your clients. You don't need to actually be good at what you do. God, that annoys Here's me. how you, and I swear to God, dude. And I think it lives in some people's programs. And I'm like, you know what? Like that's fucked yeah. because yep. I think back to when I was anorexic and fortunately the first person that helped me, I didn't have to pay. I'm not sure I had the money to pay them. But they helped me because they wanted to help me. And if that they person, saved they saved my fucking life. And I've always said, and I say in every speech, I said, the whole reason we started NCI is so that there's not another 18-year-old Jason contemplating suicide because he doesn't know what to eat. And that was almost the result. I almost killed myself because of the eating disorder. And I can't imagine empowering a trainer to make money off the back of those kinds of situations. Like it just doesn't make sense. This is, this is, this is the experience. This is what happened at 24 hour fitness. You know, we started in the, the company that really built the model and how to become successful. And I'll never forget the turning point. I was in a meeting with other general managers and up and coming district managers, and they had just had new investors come in and I'll never forget the presentation they made. And they said, look, because at the time we had sales counselors and trainers and fitness managers, and we were learning how to sell memberships through selling fitness. And, you know, there's a, there's a, these were, the, the company was built and founded by fitness people who right. also understood business, but they were fitness people first. And I'll never forget them, the presentation. The guy goes up there and says, we have more locations than anybody. I, I, we don't need salespeople to present anything. You don't need to do it. All you got to do is have the best prices. It's like a menu. You walk in, you order the membership you want, and you leave. And I remember going, this is the end. This is the beginning. And I remember yeah. my district manager, who was a fitness guy, looked at me and he said, looked at me and he said, hey, Sal, what do you think about that? And I said, that's terrible. That's not how you sell fitness. That's not how this works. They didn't believe me. That's the direction they started going. And, and you know, it turned into a few bankruptcies and, yeah. and a lot of, lot of negative changes. This annoys me, Jason, because uh, our space has all the answers for all of the chronic health issues that people suffer from in modern, all of them. Yeah. Depression, anxiety, obesity, cancer, diabetes, yep. dementia. No space has more or better answers than we do. And yet we got people going in there right now, ruining it to the point where pretty soon people aren't going to turn to us anymore. And that really annoys the shit out of me. You know, it's, it's so funny that you say that too, because as, as I think about the space, like the wealthiest coaches I know are not the best coaches. Um, and uh, I won't say the best cause they're very good. Um, I'll say the smartest, most intelligent. 
Uh, I've been really fortunate recently. So we have a live event coming up in October. Um, you know, we have uh, like Bill Campbell, William Wallace, Lane Norton, Rachel Shear. Like yeah. they're all coming out to speak. Like fucking really good minds in our industry. And I've been fortunate to talk to a couple of them on calls. And just they, the first thing they go to is business. And they're like, I'm so smart and I'm so good at what I do. I just haven't figured out how to like crack the code on like the business thing. And that's interesting to me because I'm like, what are you, what do you think you're missing? Cause I, you know, they'll share their numbers with me and stuff. And I'm like, what do you think you're missing? And they're like telling me, and I'm like, you realize a lot of those numbers being talked about are like big top line numbers. And your take home is pretty much just as much as theirs. And they're like, they really feel like they're like missing out yeah. on this thing. And I'm like, just continue to stay true to being really fucking good. But you know, there's this, there's this dissonance between like being extremely good at what you do and chasing the dollar and the happiest coaches I know are the ones that are very fucking good at what they do. The, the ones that stay in the space for a long time are the ones that are very good at what they do. The ones that have zero issues when something like COVID rolls around are the ones that are actually good at what they do. Like uh, imagine, you know, if I don't know, a COVID of the fucking online world happens, right? We're like, well, all of a sudden we can't use the internet. Yeah. Are half of the coaches that are online right now still going to be helping people? No. <laughs> And that's scary. Mm -hmm. Like, who are we putting out into the world? Mm -hmm. We're not even putting out people. We're not putting people into the world that want to create change. They just want to monetize other people's need to change. And that's kind of scary to me. Do you, do you, as, as a leader in the space, do you, I already think I already know the answer, but do you feel a responsibility to um, trying to keep the space moving in the right direction or to try to counter some of that, some of that, crap that's out there yeah i do i mean you know i've been really transparent with you and i'll be i'll be very open um on the podcast you know we we've been very blessed obviously we've built a, a big business but more importantly we've helped a lot of people and you know at our highest revenue months um you know obviously we're an eight-figure company um i would say 60 percent of that was indexed on people coming to us for business solutions where 40 percent was indexed on people coming for nutrition solutions um and as i've watched things evolve you know, the last year, year and a half, I see the business side being perpetuated more. Um, and I see more and more people with questions around that and not even understanding that the the core foundation is being very good at what you do. Um, and these are people that have taken other certifications that still feel lost. These are people that have taken no certification at all and still feel lost, but all they're thinking about is the money they'll make in the industry. And so, yeah, I mean, I think as a leader and, and as a company that I think is poised to become the leader in the space, and ultimately that's our goal, right? We have openly stated we want to impact the lives of a billion people through the vehicle of health and fitness. Um, we have to do that. You know, if we want a billion lives being touched, we want a billion lives being touched successfully, not because somebody had the marketing capacity to do so. Now, I'm also of the opinion, if you have a really, really good skill set, you 100% should know how to get yourself visible. Of you course. should know how to market you. And you deserve to be compensated for what you've invested into growing that skill set. I, I make no bones about that. I believe coaches should be amongst the highest paid uh, industries in the world. Um, but I think first, you got to really fucking be good at what you do. What yeah. would that ratio look like in, in an ideal world for you personally? Uh, like percentage of people that are going through NCI versus BCI. So if we're looking at uh, units sold, um, probably 70, 30. If we're looking at revenue, we're probably looking, because obviously the business products are more expensive. Of course. If we're looking at units sold, 70% nutrition, 30% business. But I think revenue, that's probably going to trend back down towards like 55, 40. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, understandable. I, so I, so uh, how do you feel about this? Because this is, we talk about this, especially early on, we talked about this a lot. Now I think not so much because we know this is what we're doing. Yeah. I think the best strategy uh, to lead this space, and again, I'd love your opinion on this, is to do it the right way and to show everyone else that not only can I do it the right way, but I can make money doing it the right way. Because yep. otherwise, you're not going to win that 100%. battle because we got to fight fire with fire. 100%. So we got to be able to use the same tricks they use, but do it with integrity, do it effectively, and do it the right way. So that way, people can go into the space who are passionate and they don't feel like they have a choice of being poor or lying. Yep. The options are not that. The options are actually, I can do this the right way and do well. Yeah. You know, it's, I was talking to Alex yesterday and he was saying, you know, when I was in the space, I always met people where they were. And I was like, what do you mean by that? He said, true or false, somebody in their local area is going to promote a detox, a fat flush, some bullshit like that. So mm -hmm. true. Absolutely. He said, okay, true or false. That's what the consumer thinks they want. 
True. He said, so if I show up and I say macros and patience, who are they going to choose? So them. Right. He said, so how do I get them to choose me first? He said, I got to meet them where they are. They want the detox. They want the fat flush. They want, so he said, okay, cool. He's like, hey, come here. We're going to talk about a detox. Then they come in and it's like, listen, the detox that we're talking about is the shit that you've already tried. It's not part of this program, right? Like, sure, for three days, mm -hmm. we'll detox you, but then you're going to do macros. You're going to do patience. You're going to learn accountability, blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, so, but you still have to get their attention. You still have to meet them where they're at. And I always thought that was a really good lesson. Um, you know, I think coaches right now, it's okay to talk about the financial upside of being a coach and making good money. But the first conversation has to be, what is your skill set? Or can you deliver the promises? And I ask every coach this whenever I talk business. And I said, the first thing is, if I sent 10 clients your way, on a scale of one to 10, what's your confidence level that you could help all 10 clients deliver the result that they mm -hmm. want? And the number of times that I don't get 10 is really scary. Um, an event you guys came to, I think it was two, three years ago, we called it Impact Income in Arizona. Mm -hmm. There's like 300 people in the room. I asked all 300 people, I said, how many of you guys could raise your hand and tell me how you create the results that you do. Meaning like you actually have a process. Like it's, it's not just this like reactionary bullshit. How many people do you think raise their hand? Yeah, probably very little. Three. Yeah. Three out of almost 300. And if, if I had to bring them on stage and offer them 10 grand, probably not gonna be able to do it, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably zero. And so what does that tell us? Like it tells me as the owner of a company that I'm more excited about people getting the right education and people learning the right application of what they know because when they do, the upside for them is Jason, astronomical. Here, here's the irony of what we're talking about. Okay. Here's the, this is the big, uh, for me, I try to communicate this a lot because I know that there's a false choice that the consumer thinks that they're making. The consumer thinks if I do it this way, the wrong way, I'm going to get results faster. Yep. If I do it the quote unquote right way, it's going to take me so long or maybe it'll never happen. And that's the hard way. The reality is there's this way, which will get you there and keep you there. And then there's nothing else. Yep. There is no faster, also effective way. It's literally, there is only one way to make this happen for reals, everybody. And it's this, everything else it's illusion. is a lie. So that's the real choice. And I, I, we need to communicate that better because otherwise what will happen is I'm going to be competing with advertisers who are saying things that aren't true and the consumer thinks their choices are fast or slow. That's what they think. That's when in it. reality, it's yes or no. There is no other way. Yeah. Like that soundbite should be pulled and played everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like the consumer thinks it's fast or slow when in reality, it's yes or no. Right. Like that's it right there. Like mic drop, the end. Um, you know, I mean, think about mind pump. I mean, you guys have been in this for what? 10 nine, years now? Nine years. Almost. Nine yeah. years. Yeah. Right. Think about on day one, if somebody's like, you could buy the number of downloads that you have today, yeah. right? It would have been appealing. <laughs> like, let's be honest. You're like, yeah. yo, we'll snap our fingers. You're you're making whatever you're making. You get the number, you're like, yo, I'm I'm in, right? Right. But you guys are all intelligent enough to know, like if I buy that, like there's no way in hell, A, that it's legit, B, that we're keeping it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so instead, like you would 100% trade it for the journey you've been on. Because you know now definitively, not only do you have what you've produced, but you have potential in so many other different verticals, well, right? Yeah. Like you think about all the other doors it's open for you because of the journey, because you've done it the right way. And this is, this is why lottery winners, pro athletes yeah. go broke yeah. because they get this windfall of money or success overnight and they didn't build the habits and behaviors of what it takes the average or normal person to achieve that level. So of let success. me ask you this then, how do you think that's going to trickle back down, right? Because if, if what's being promoted now is success as a coach is, you know, highly monetizable. What about the trainers in the gold's gyms, yeah. in the EOS, in the lifetimes, right? Are they good anymore? Hmm. And, and at what point does that now penetrate the public marketplace where the public marketplace actually knows? And, you know, I think that this is a whole nother conversation. So according how to are we QCing the space? Right. Like I think now the space is bigger than ever. There's more people working in health and fitness than ever, mm -hmm. which means a, there's more competition, but B there's less people that are really good at what they do. How are we quality? Check? It's an opportunity. Uh, yeah. It's a massive opportunity. It's a, because yeah, if you absolutely. look at it, here's what's happened. Okay. Over the last just two decades, the health and fitness space has grown year over year, over year. Yep. More people are buying health and fitness products, 
having gym memberships, gyms are growing, all that stuff uh, is growing year over year over year. But what has also happened over the last two decades, health has gotten worse consistently, right? Year over year over year. So you could either look at this and it's the, this kind of dystopian, oh crap, uh, you know, we're, we're going the wrong direction. Everything's going to crap or opportunity. If you're here, here's the beauty of, we, I, and I hate saying this out loud, but it's true. When we started this, this business, we were confident that we would do well because we're competing with idiots. idiots. I, 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 it's, this <laughs> it's is true. true. No, no, it's true. We're competing with idiots. You want to separate yourself in the, in the health and fitness space, be honest, do a good job. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of spaces where that doesn't really separate you. You get into tech and you're, you know, you kind of do a good job, deliver good product. Like, good luck. You're competing against some, some brilliant people. Yeah. There's a lot of morons in our space and it's, it's, it's an opportunity. So for people listening who want to be coaches and trainers, the opportunity is huge because you're competing against a lot of liars yep. and a lot of idiots. And that's great. Now for the consumer, it sucks, but hopefully we can educate the consumer so they can make that the right decision. I, I think part of the reason why we're seeing that is because the people that are seeing the most um, are the ones that not necessarily are doing it the right way. And so you're just getting a whole cohort of people that, oh, this, he's got this, these things or he's famous on Instagram. Therefore, he's the one doing it right. And so you've all of a sudden shifted this huge majority of people in a direction. And I, I do think, I think we're going to see a fallout, right? I do mm -hmm. think that like even Instagram hasn't been that popular for that long. And you're going to see a lot of turnover of these people that were flashing a pan. They made a lot of money for a short period of time but they don't have the real staying power. And so I think you're going to start to see that turnover and people are going to hopefully, this is the optimistic side of me, kind of wake up a little bit, you know, and you're going to want to see either one, like the proof that, oh, this guy has gone and done it in real life for it's a long period of time, record. or, oh, they've been around for 20, 30 years doing this because uh, a lot of people are going to come and go, in, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. they'll stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, they're the the ones that had true staying power through all this, like uh, in the gym, they're going to recognize those those quality trainers. And it's just one of those things. It's like it's been right in front of everybody the whole time. It's just been convoluted with all this like excess of information, Noise. information overload. And so, how do we filter through all this stuff and? Um, and I think like, it's going to peel itself back to reveal, like this has been the way the whole time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a dichotomy and I could go, I mean, there's so many different rabbit holes we could go into, but I think a lot of people get into health and fitness in the very beginning with a small level of insecurity. Um, I know I did, totally. I know we've, I know we've talked about it on other podcasts I've been on. Right. And so, you know, that's the polar opposite of what it requires to <laughs> stay true to being good, you know, right? Yeah. Because it takes a very secure individual to, you know, plant their, put their flag in the ground and say, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, I look at Lane Norton, man, and I have such a massive amount of respect for what he's done. Because when he first came to the space, like the the bro science guys, I mean, they fucking blasted him. And oh, yeah. like, you you know, and and Lane has always stayed true. Listen, science is science. And now I would argue he's one of the most respected people. And I would say so many ideas are, they fall in line with a lot of what, totally. what he brought to the space. And so I have such massive amount of respect for him. You know, look at the fitness space and, and you know, people blasted CrossFit, you know, since it came in. They have never wavered from mm -hmm. what they believe to be the truth. Now, we could argue all day long true or not true. And, and I think that, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, but I, I think that the security and I mean, I won't say Greg Glassman secure, but the, you know, the whole front end of CrossFit, like they were very secure in what they did. And they're like, this is what we do. And so when you have a, a subset of people that come in back to the previous insecurity and you're asking them to instantly overnight become very secure in what they're putting out, I think that's where a lot of it comes from. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's very hard because they're going to question themselves. They, because they're going to be questioned at every turn, you know, they're going to say like, Oh, well, you know, Lane and, and science tells us carbs aren't the enemy. And, and then all of a sudden the keto zealots, you know, get up in their face, well, carbs aren't even a essential nutrient and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, they'll yell louder. And now the insecure person becomes more insecure. And it's like, fuck, like, how do we win that battle? And I think the only way to win the battle is to continue to put out the right education, to, to encourage people to receive the right education. But most importantly, and, and I mean, you know, this is me planting my flag at the ground with NCI is to get people to engage in application, man. I think that like you guys could stand on mountaintops and say maps is the best thing in the world. The people that have done maps, they know the power in it, right? When we can facilitate application of the right shit, I think that's when we're moving forward in the world is like, 
We know this to be true. How do we get users to actually engage in it? And I think that's the real key. And that's what we have to figure yeah, out. Yeah, I think one of the one of the first places to start uh, is to, because you can look at the, the social media space or the online space, and you look at the people with the most followers, yep. which you would think, okay, these are the most successful people. What are they doing? And many times what they're doing is they're using their bodies as social evidence or proof of their, like how good they are. So yep. look how fit I look, look how ripped I am. Look how beautiful I look. This is a huge mistake for somebody who wants to become a successful coach. First off, you have to be the 0.0001% to really use your body in an effective right. way to get that kind of very, so it's probably not going to happen. But number two, you're digging yourself a hole. You're going to always have to look that way if that's because if that's yep. your evidence. And number three, if you have any kind of integrity, what you're doing is you're promoting the falseness or the myth that that the way you look is 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 going to communicate your knowledge and effectiveness. Yep. Now, of course, you don't want to look like you don't do any fitness right. or don't work out at all. There's extremes there. Um, but the consumer, it, it's very easy way to convince a consumer. But I always caution people to use that strategy. Don't use that strategy. You're going to have to maintain it. If it does work, the odds that it'll work are very small. But if it does... You got to maintain that. And number two, you're doing the industry a, a huge uh, service. I mean, yeah. The the more you do that, the more jeopardy you're putting the longevity of your business in. I mean, that's just going to cause a key man problem, right? In and of itself. But that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love what you said in the sense that you're perpetuating a, such a false narrative. And, you know, the reality is how you look is one factor of your life. And as somebody with, you know, openly has body image <laughs> issues to this day, still have it, right? 39 years old. To allow that to drive the other areas of your life is so misleading at best. And so if I went out and, and I mean, like I, you know, we were talking before this, you know, I've, I've been, uh, I've done all my HRT work with Transcend, you know, my diet's in a good place, my training's in a good place. Like I walk around sub 8% body fat as it is right now. And if I like constantly posted pictures, could I probably go back to selling nutrition coaching? The sad reality is, yeah, I right. probably could. Um, but I don't want people to be like, well, I want to be like Jason and look like that. No, like that is one component of my life. What makes me the happiest, you know, in the world right now is, dude, I spend more time with my daughter now than I have in the five years that she's been on this planet. So like, if I put that on the world, is that going to sell any kind of coaching? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But that's what life is to me. You know, like I'm out here, I'm with you guys. Like I, I'm hosting clients in Arizona this week. I spend time with my daughter as much as I possibly can. I play lots of golf. Like those are the things I care about. And so which at the end of the day, you know, if I died next week, like people are like, were you happy? Yeah, like I was. You, and so you want to know what's funny, Jason, managing gyms. This is true. hundred percent. When you would have, let's say you manage a big gym, you got 15 trainers. Okay. And there's varying degrees of fitness among your trainers. The most ripped fit looking trainers were never the most successful. Never. 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 They I never. Was, now I'm not saying they were, they were too much into themselves yes. getting ripped than getting mm -hmm. their clients ripped. Or, or they were struggling with such severe body image yeah, issues yeah, and dysmorphia probably. that both. they were tanking themselves. They didn't have the energy to do it. Dude, when I was, when I was in LA, I ran a gym at Beverly Hills and you know, West Hollywood is right there. And, um, I had, you know, a decent population from there. And so, uh, I had a chiropractor who was a celebrity chiropractor. Um, and he was a gay guy and he comes in and he said, dude, he said, uh, he goes, you need to not be so jacked and ripped. And I was like, why? I'm like, I'm like, this is like, it's a personal thing. Like I enjoy it. He's like, yeah. He's like, but you're like unattainable. Hmm. He's like, people look at you and they're like, I could never look like that without steroids. And I was like, well, I'm not on steroids. I was like, but I was like, this is for me. And, and he's like, yeah. He's like, I know that is your client. I'm like, cool. Then like, if it takes me longer to grow clients that like I'm authentically connected to, I'm okay with that. And so I made the choice to be happy myself. I didn't do it for anyone else. And like, was there like a vanity com like component? Yeah, but it was vanity for me. It wasn't vanity for social media. It wasn't vanity for other people. And so I think this comes down to a whole thing. It's okay to chase vanity. I have zero issues with people chasing vanity. But make sure that the person that you are trying to please is the person in the mirror. Yeah, you're not, not vanity for the sake of someone else being like, oh, look at his abs or yeah. look at her ass or, you know, whatever. Like you're more than welcome to chase those things. We should all be encouraged to do that, right? Like in life, we are given one opportunity yeah. to have the things we desire. If that's what you desire, like more power to you. Don't make it a fucking sales tool. Yeah, but you also, I mean, you, you, you also, look, you have two trainers, one obsessed with their body and one obsessed with their clients who's going to be more yeah, successful. Yeah, that's all, amen. That all day, you're going to see that. I, I have a, a selfish question to ask you. I yeah. think you're probably 
one of the most connected people in the fitness space. I don't know anybody else who has probably had the opportunity to do deep dives on people's businesses and uh, connect, network, collaborate with a lot of very successful and not so successful people in our space. You openly talk about you have drive to be financially successful and you also have a lot of integrity. So when you look at the entire landscape and all the people you've met, what are th- who are what are three businesses that you admire the most and why? Are we talking businesses that people know or like just clients that I've touched? No, not, not even just clients like, or businesses that, you know, like you've literally, like we've already rattled off in this conversation, probably 10, 15 other people like the Hormozies and people like that, that have successful businesses, which businesses do you look at? And the reason why I'm asking this is one of the things that we're, we're, you know, bitching about right now is that there's so many terrible people that are being highlighted in all these yeah, trainers. Yeah. And I know we have a lot of trainers Let's listening right now. Good ones. Let's highlight some people who not only are like, you know, have integrity, but also are probably really successful business wise. And maybe you don't know it because maybe they're not the 5 million followers on yeah, yeah. Instagram or that. So when you look at the landscape and you go like, I really like these three businesses and, and, and why. So let's, let's name a couple of them. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I mean, if I choose any of my clients, they're all going to bitch that like I didn't choose them, right? So it's like <laughs> this is a double-edged sword for me. Um, I think uh, there's so many that come to mind, man. I have, I, A, like let me just first say, I think anybody that gets into business with the intent of helping people, I have respect. I don't care how good yeah. you are, how bad you are. I think if I disagree with your tactics, I still have respect for you. Um, I still think as long as your pure intent is genuinely to help people, like we can disagree on on the methods all day long, like you have my respect. Um, so I'll openly say that well, I think uh, not to cut you off, but just so you don't feel like you get pigeonholed into like highlighting one of somebody that you've coached and trained, maybe stick with the people that you've had speak at your events. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, they're, they're already, they're not necessarily people that you've coached. Yeah. And that's trained, good, yeah. That's good. But um, you know, there's a lot of these and, and I'm sure there's some of them, you know, their business and you're like, Oh, he's made a lot of money, but I wouldn't want to yeah. have to do that or it's not my thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, I'm going to shout out four of my clients that have just done exceptionally well in like the last year. And like, I'm just going to lump them into yeah, like go one on. um, because they just made a commitment to themselves. They were going to see it through. They were going to do it on a big level. And, and most people probably haven't heard of any of them. Um, you know, one would be Stephanie Fusnick. Um, she's just married. So that's not her last name anymore, but I forget it. She so. just interviewed me yesterday. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Great. So like, bro, she literally went from like, Seventy thousand dollars a year to over a million dollars a year. I didn't even like know less. that. Yeah. Wow. You wouldn't know it. Wow. So hands down, one of the nicest human beings in the world, um, Casey Miller, um, who uh, it may be back to story now, but Casey um, started with us. She was sleeping on an air mattress. She went all in on herself. Uh, half a million plus a year. Amazing. Uh, Jared Hamilton, who came to me as an influencer, already had it. Like he had all the assets. He just didn't know how to do it, but he humbled himself in a way to get like the right thing and. Um, so much respect to him. And then, uh, Mason Mahoney and Audrey Adams who have just continuously like leveled up and, um, who hit, a, they, they did so much of what we've talked about today. They hit such a financial success point where they were like, you know what, we want to choose the happiness point and we always want to do it the right way. And, and they've always been like, they've kept that at the forefront. So those four, uh, for sure. I think, um, Jen Gottlieb, who a lot of people may not know, uh, she spoke last year at coaching con. She was on the first day. Wasn't that, is that. She's the PR. Lewis Houses ex? Uh, Jen Dotley? Is that what you said? No, 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 no. Um, oh, I, I know that is a Jen, but that's oh, not. Okay, no, no, sorry. no. Um, mm-hmm. thought that that's Doc well. Jen. Jen Esquire, maybe? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. it was close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so Jen Gottlieb, um, I think she actually just did a post recently. She did like some fitness stuff and she was like on VH1 and she's like, I was miserable at the time. And like, she just, she loves PR. She loves branding. She loves all that stuff. Um, her and Chris Winfield, her husband, they own a PR agency and they are just the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Um, she has, she's gone on to do just huge things. Um, and she told me like, when we first started talking, she's like, I'm going to do this public speaking thing. Like I'm going to get on lots of stages and I've watched her from not a lot of people knew who she was, dude. She's on massive stages now. And so like just respect for being like, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think she's amazing. You know, Billy Jean is just a good friend. I love the guy. He is as fucking true as they come. Um, and, and if you ever go spend time with him, uh, he will reiterate that and he will show you that. And so I have a lot of respect there. Um, one guy that I'm, I'm excited to continue to get to know who's speaking at this year's coaching con. So this is the first public announcement. Nobody knows this yet. So spoiler alert, 
Uh, but Sean Stevenson mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. is coming. So Model Health Show. Uh, big fan of Sean because he's just like he literally started as like the sleep guy and he's just evolved that into like into that. Um, and so you know he every time I've spoken to him about coming to the event, it's always come back to the impact of the event. It, it was never about the money. It was never about the travel. It was like he always talked about the impact of the event. Like what were we doing? And I have just a ton of respect for that. Um, you know, everybody else is like huge names. And so I think everybody would give them respect, but I think those are some names that a lot of people may not realize like the impact that those people are having in the world. How, what are some of the key things someone could focus on to build, uh, a successful business in health and fitness, but to do it the right way? Like, what are some things they should look out for? You know, like we mentioned earlier, like don't just use your body as at yeah. as, as a market, but what are some things they can look out for and what are things they should focus on? To I think do a it? lot of people need to recognize that your insecurities are going to be challenged repeatedly over the course of your business career. Um, from the very first time that you begin learning something, it's going to challenge what you thought to be true um, to the very first time that you have to apply it. It's going to challenge your own thought process around whether or not you think you can help somebody to the very first time that you ask somebody for money. Uh, it's going to challenge your your beliefs around money uh, to the time that you have to hire somebody. It's going to challenge your beliefs around leadership. Um, and I think that if you're not prepared for that, then you're not prepared to be a business owner. And that's also okay. I think that there is this stigma that to to be a coach, to be a trainer, that you have to be a CEO and that you have to be a business owner. Um, I wear the CEO hat today out of necessity. I don't love the CEO hat. I'm just being honest. I love being a visionary and I love, I actually love the client connection. I don't like fucking spreadsheets and paperwork and like, I, I fucking hate that shit. So, um, you know, mine happened more out of necessity because I wanted something of extreme impact and I was willing to, to lean into that. But I think if, you know, it all comes back to the same front door, so to speak, which is, you know, to get into the industry, you have to be willing to get the skill set. You have to be willing to become very good at what you do. And, None of none of the people that you've brought on this podcast, you know, you guys have done 2,000 plus episodes at this point, right? None of the people that you guys have brought in here, you brought in because you're like, wow, like you're blowing up on social media. No. You brought them in because you're like, you're actually good at something, right? And look at that. Like, look at the doors. I think back to like how I actually got in here like the first time. Someone asked me the other day, like, how'd you get on Mind Pump? And I said, well, Jay Faruja connected us. And I don't even know if you guys remember that, mm-hmm. but Jason I did Frugia, remember that it was Jay. I was actually, when you said that, I was like, oh, who would first introduced us? I it was remember. Jay. Yeah. And so then I was like, how'd you, how'd I get on Jay's? And somebody had connected me to Jay. And I thought that like that time I went to Jason's and, you know, I spent time with him at his place in Santa Monica at the time. Had I not actually been good at what I did and had I not been able to showcase that to you him, would I would have never been here. Us. I would have never been here. Yeah. Had I not come here the first time, when I reached out to you a year later and said, hey, I want to advertise, you would have never let me do it. And it all started with the same place. And so I think a lot of people are just looking at like the wrong part of the career. And, and quite honestly, they shouldn't even be thinking about the quote unquote career. It's like, you got to get the skill set. Here's you, the just, you just highlighted what we were just talking about as the trainer journey too. Like so focused on the destination and trying yeah. to get, oh, get to mind pump. I'll pay, you know, $20,000 to be on yeah. it, but does nothing for you if you didn't, work the journey, prove yourself. On Think the about there. the overweight person. Yeah. Think about Ozempic. Like, and, and it's, you know, all the shit that's coming out. Like, you're going to fucking take a pill. You're going to lose the weight. Are you going to keep it off? No. Like, you can't skip the journey. Yeah. Just, Jason, I was just going to say, literally, that uh, w- people in fitness, if you're, if you become a trainer or a coach, you probably love fitness, or at least you should. If you don't, probably don't do this, but you probably love it and you've been doing it for a while. Here's the, here's the cheat sheet, or should I say advantage? The advantage is the lessons that you learned on that journey are exactly the same lessons that are gonna, you're going to um, encounter in business. Yep. Okay, so can you go from, I can barely do a body weight squat to squatting 300 pounds overnight? No. How does it work? You go practice. You suck at it. You try. Oops, got to do mobility. Got to try this other stuff. Oh, here's a weak link here. Got to maybe do this other exercise. Move away from squats. Try something else. Go back to it. And eventually you get to this point where you hit the goal, but now you love it so much, you're always going to do it anyway, no yep. matter what. Okay. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with what you're doing here. You t- you just said, you don't think to yourself like, I'm a CEO. Or, yeah, because that's okay. You're going to learn. Right. It's You're going to suck. You're going to learn. You're going to suck. You're going to learn. It's no different than the journey that you've been on with working out with fitness. So the reason why I communicate that is when you get into the space to build your business and you run into the struggles, 
remind you, self, remind yourself that it's just like when you yeah. first started working out. It's just like your clients yeah. going through this, this process. It's going to be the same exact thing. So when you're frustrated, just like you got frustrated the first time you couldn't do a barbell squat, well, now you can. Yep. How can you now? Well, you've been practicing. That's all it is. Literally, that's all it is. I would add to that too. When you first got into it, you asked for help, right? Mm. You There was resources out there and there you you sifted through the resources yeah. to find the ones that you trusted, the ones that had proven themselves to, to be worthy. By the way, when you become a coach, there's still resources for you. I think that you know one of my favorite things, I will humble myself to this day. I don't give a shit how many people I've coached. I don't give a shit uh, how many businesses I've helped. If I don't know the answer, I'm going to a resource mm-hmm. that can help me find the answer. You know, when I did my first UFC weight cut, uh, I was petrified of rehydrating the guy. I knew like guaranteed I get the weight off. I was like, probably going to change the game the way that I do it compared to them. I'm like, I don't know shit about rehydration. Mm -hmm. And I called my buddy Tyler Minton and he, you know, he did Habib's like the first time Habib came back, he worked with Mm -hmm. DC and I said, bro, can you just do the rehydration and teach me? And he's like, yeah, like zero questions asked. Didn't give a shit. He's like, we don't have to tell anybody. And I'm like, dude, I'll tell the world. Like I'm, I'm humble enough to ask for help. And I think that a lot of people that are afraid to get in because they don't yet have the knowledge need to remember that, yeah. you know, to, you know, not to talk NCI, but the reason that we built NCI the way we did was, you know, once you're certified, you're, you have access to our community for life because I know one day you're going to encounter a challenge that you don't know the answer to that for whatever reason, level one didn't equip you for, or that whatever reason level two didn't equip you for like, We've been as thorough as we possibly can, but at some point you're going to encounter a situation that's just different. Great. Ask. Like, let me help. Let one of our instructors help. Let another community member help. And I think that like when you have those things and you remember and you're willing to lean into them, it makes the journey a little bit easier. I, Nobody had to go through this alone. And I, I, look, I'll use an, I'll use an example, um, uh, kind of what we're talking about. I remember when uh, I really made the realization that the gym industry was wasn't as great as I thought it was. I remember in a meeting specifically, they showed us the members that make the gym money yep. and the ones that cost the gym money. <laughs> okay. And it was, I remember I was, my heart was heartbroken because yeah. the members that lost the gym money were the heavy users. And I don't mean heavy as in body weight. Yeah, consistent, I mean, frequent users. These are people that come in five days a week, consistently work out all the time. They pay their monthly membership. They lose us money because they wear down the equipment. They don't buy anything else. And that's it. Planet who, Hollywood's model or uh, Planet Fitness's model. Yeah, that's right. Who are the people that made the gym money? The, the most money? That the, never came. The ones that paid and never came. And I said, whoa, this is crazy. Like this, we, this is not, this, this doesn't feel right yeah. in my, in my bones. Why am I saying that right now? Because the coaching space is getting flooded with people and it's becoming a race to the bottom who could charge the least and do the most, who can create the most volume, produce the most, you know, the best top line, but really produce the worst results. Yep. Um, you can do it differently and be very successful. You know, it's, you it's guys cool. have proven that by the way, it's funny you guys have you shown that, that though. We, we just started looking. So a, a very important metric that we track in the business is the use rate of our products. Um, we want 85% that have purchased the product actively engaged and using the product at any given time. Uh, we'd love 100, but we know 85% yeah. is feasible. Uh, of the people that don't use it, right? Where do you think they fall off? Oh, God. First seven days. So there's, so there's 14 weeks, right? In a cohort model. First seven okay. days. Bingo. They don't even start. Yeah, that's it. These people are willing to put money yeah. down and then they don't start. Don't and so like, that's actually something that we're tackling right now, which yeah. is like, how do we... and and we've gone in and I think we've done it and we've you know, done some new onboarding things, but um, ironically for coaches out there, you know, if you're a coach, your onboarding experience is one of the most critical things you have in your business. The first 48 hours are, mm-hmm. are so pivotal towards the way that a consumer experiences your product. But um, yeah, it's, it's mind blowing to me. There is, there's something around that. I can't imagine building a business predicated on people not using the product. Like, I mean, we're aware that it happens. Every business owner knows, but I mean, that's, awesome. that's what I'm going that's after. That's the reason that's why problem. I think we all have like a, like a subtle distaste for planet fitness. I mean, if it's your local gym and you got to use it, whatever, but we know that the model is built yeah. off of the idea that we 
truly don't want people to get fit. Yeah. We don't want them to show up really. We want if they did, to, we would go out of business. The model is built they off of those rates. Can we make we have figured out a price that is low enough that people will justify paying it even if they don't use it by simply offering free pizza on Fridays because they'll do the math like, well, if I have three slices of pizza a that, month, that already pays for the that membership. covers the membership. So even if I don't show up the gym, that's a no brainer. I'll just pay for it. And then you attract wow. that type of person. If you discourage the the guy or girl in the fitted tank top who grunts and gets into their workout. We don't want so you, you here. You don't because want. You'll actually use our equipment. Yeah, and you'll use exactly. it hard. And, and you and position it. it you position it as calling them lunks and that that's they're wild. This, I they're, actually hadn't considered that part of it. Yeah, and they're oh, negative. No, no, no this is 100%, I hadn't considered bro. like the equipment use. Obviously, I understood the like the show up rate and those things. But I hadn't considered like the the excessive wear and tear of people that actually all the way. Use that's the how. That's how. From a business standpoint, it's absolutely brilliant. But there's the part of me that I have distaste for because. I recognize exactly what they went out and did, and why they are so madly successful. Did you because, see the stock plummeted last week. Uh, they've been they've been because they fired their CEO overnight. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, like randomly, a board voted him out, and then uh, apparently he's going to stay on the board and still have some sort of advisory role. But literally overnight, the board voted him out, and that day it signaled like lots of questions, and so their stock why. plummeted like forty five percent in a day. I wonder yeah, why. No, it's, it's at it, an all time low right now. Here's 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 what's crazy to me. Okay. Uh, name one thing that if you improve also improves everything else in your life besides your health. Nothing. Nothing. If you improve your health, everything improves. Okay. And yet you could get a gym membership for nine bucks a month. Okay. That's how, that's how terrible of a job our industry has done at actually delivering what health and fitness can really do. That people balk at a $50 a month membership. Okay. Yep. But we'll spend hundreds of dollars a month on a quick coffee that they get every morning or a cell phone charge or streaming services. That's insane to me. Yeah. I'll, I'll look, Adam knows these numbers. We sell a program if they're on sale for 50 or 70 bucks. If it's on sale, if it's full price around a hundred bucks, right? Our app, what's our lifetime value? About 740 bucks. Okay. So our average program. customer has yeah. invested. $700 and our programs when they're on sale are between 50 to 70 bucks. That's the one, that's the number we're most proud of yeah. right there. We're so proud of that number. I don't care if you get me a million more customers, if they don't stick around, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the one thing that has the power to literally change everything. I mean, you know, I think back to, I, I would say like losing my dad last year has impacted me way more than I probably like led on to publicly or openly discussed. And I think about it every day. Like, it, like, dude, I would give anything to have him back. And my dad was extremely unhealthy. And if I could just get him to change his habits, like the last two years that he was living, I think he'd probably still be here today. Oh, that's tough. And it's, and it's just like, man, like, it, there's no money involved in that. There's no fame involved in that. There's nothing that anyone else in the world would even know or experience. But I would... I'd get to have my dad. Jason, here. here's here's how here's how uh, I'm not going to at, at the at the thread of painting a, a super bleak picture. Here's what we're up against. Okay, think of the average unhealthy consumer, and then think of the average healthy consumer. Okay, look at the purchasing habits. Yep. Go to the grocery store. Yep. What percentage of the products in the grocery store uh, are purchased by unhealthy people versus healthy people? Something like 80, 20, was, or more like yeah, I was ninety. Guess eighty or ninety. Ten. Yep. How much money is an unhealthy consumer worth to the pharmaceutical industry versus a healthy oh. consumer? Uh, think of other purchases, clothing. Um, uh, well, here, let me touch anything on that, that Anything quick. you can use to numb or you can use to distract. Uh, the unhealthy consumer is going to consume more. So literally, we're fighting the entire market. So let me touch on that because I think that I had a, I had a conversation, really interesting conversation with somebody yesterday on the outlook of the health and fitness industry. And, and somebody said, you know, it's going to be scary to be in health and fitness because there's pills coming out <laughs> that will destroy the appetite and lose body fat. Right. Right. So I don't think it's happening, but whatever, not, sure. not here to debate it. If, if the amount of R and D that's going in on the medical side is increasing that much, they know they're starting to lose the war mm. a little bit. Right. Cause like you just said, they're, they make so much money on lack of health. And if they're willing to risk some of that money to now go out and make the money on health, you know that times are changing. You know that people are starting to at least think about health, right? So we're making a dent, but that dent is nothing. Like you said earlier, like 
we're still fatter. We're still more obese. We're still more unhealthy. We we still lack lots of knowledge, and we haven't even scratched Dude, the surface, I just, man. I, I just wonder. If, I wonder if it's a dent per se, or and I actually think we've had this conversation. It was one of our first conversations, and I and I believe I brought up the point of like. I believe that it, like the, the the pendulum has swung so far, like we're getting so sick, so unhealthy, it's getting so bad that it inevitably has to come back the sure. other direction. And I think we, I hope that we have reached that. I just that point. I just read a study on the show where they took uh, people who were treated for in the hospital for depression. So consider the person, right? If you get hospitalized for depression, it's really bad. Yep. Okay. They took groups of people, they divided them, and one group they had them. Uh, they had a window in the room that faced the east. That's it. Yep. Open. So the sun came up and they got to see the rising sun as it rose. Okay? Right. They were in the hospital three days less. From that. Wow. Three days less. Now, what are the incentives for the medical industry to build rooms like that for depression? Zero. Nothing. In fact, the incentives are the opposite. We're going to lose money if we, if we no put them in rooms. Or one facing west. We, we can't because they're going to be out three days earlier. That's that's what that study actually does. It actually gives them an incentive to do the opposite. Look at the mental health studies. And that are for coming sure, out. by the way, there's some evil person building a building that absolutely one hundred percent knows that stat. And, and goes, that person is, I guarantee you, not healthy. Yeah. But to speak to what you said, and like the pendulum, right? We've we've swung so far to the state of like lack of health that it's starting to come the other way. Concurrent with the rate of growth of the marketing shit is actually scary to me yeah. yeah, because now we're going to start the swing backwards. And and I think this is what you are seeing is now you're just seeing fear mongering. Yeah. Now you're, you're seeing a lot of bad every day. Yeah. Oh, your, your guts fucked up. Your hormones are <laughs> fucked up. Your thyroid's fucked up. Like you're so fucked up. You have to have me. And it's like, no, like, yeah. by the way, like dig into, and I've done this. Like I, I, I research what everybody puts out there because I'm fascinated and I love to learn. Like I'm actually hoping that I learn something. And a lot of times what I uncover is that virtually everyone's saying the same thing, which at the core of most things, health and fitness is really just stress control to facilitate adaptations. Yeah. Like, which the opening statement I've made in every certification is this whole game is predicated on stress and adaptation. You know what I think we need to do better? Because I, I think, I don't think this is the answer, but I think this is, uh, this is part of the strategy that will be effective. For, for too long, fitness and health has been sold uh, by the aesthetics. Yep. And and I get that. Y if you're fit and healthy, you look better. Yep. A fact, right? Health radiates. You're probably going to look leaner. Yep. You're going to have better posture, all that stuff. So everybody's already connected that. Here's what we're not selling enough. The mental health benefits. Okay? Amen. In fact, if you were to look at the benefits of fitness and exercise, and you were looking at physiological health benefits and mental health benefits, the mental health benefits actually occur faster yep. and more consistently. And what are we suffering for from right now in terms of, we have a terrible health Anxiety, epidemic to begin depression. with. Anxiety and depression here's, are exploding. Here's the fucked up part. Though. And nothing go, does it better than health and fitness. Let's go back to our government friends though. They're never going to approve us talking about that. No, and, no. and like we talked about all the FTC shit, right? Like you want to go back to, to us now making statements in advertising or anywhere publicly that this shit works. Bro, we will fucking Bro, did have, you, did you like, see, we'll have agents. Talk about did, you see what, like, did you see what Tom Delauer just posted? posted? No. Mm -hmm. Pull it up, Doug. Uh, he just, this is just this morning. I just saw, I was telling the guys out on the way here. Yeah. Uh, supposedly, uh, talking YouTube about is pulling like any, any health professionals that are talking about sunlight it. being yeah. healthy and so, so if that's in I'm, your content now, it's going to get. I'm telling you, the minute, the, the minute you start putting out truth, that goes against what we were talking about on the medical side, because right now, yeah, like brain health, like medical, you know, things like depression, mental health is so big. Like the, the amount of money they're making is so fucking high that if we start talking about simple shit, like sunlight, like movement, like fucking working out, eating better. And we actually start core. We create the correlation. They're going to sue us. Jason, yeah, let me ask you the dips into their profit. Read, read this real quick before you yeah. go. Under so. the, yeah. Under the new YouTube guidelines for health information, they have categorized sunlight in the medical category. That means that only content from doctors and quote unquote approved sources can have videos on sunlight be visible. Unreal. Yeah. So <laughs> let, look, let me ask you this, Jason. You've been working out for a long time. Uh, is the way you look in the top five reasons why you continue to do it or is mental health in the top five? So I'll be very honest. When I started, all I cared about was how I looked because all that's where it started. 100%. I'll tell you today, mental health is 
probably higher. And he, like, I'll give you this statement. Last time I came here, I told you guys that I was struggling with the notion of like losing weight and like the way I was going to look on sure. stage, right? Like, I, like we talked openly about that. I'll tell you today, like I genuinely, like the way somebody perceives me to look, I give zero fucks. That's amazing. I've come so far since like we did that podcast and like, you know, obviously like my friends in my inner circle knows like I'm pursuing playing golf at like a higher level. And so I've, you know, just done things that are functional for that. And obviously I've lost some muscle. And so, yeah, like at times I challenge like my own identity in a gym. I'm like, Oh, I can't, you know, I can't squat 500 anymore. Mm -hmm. And like, so it still like bums me out, but like, I'm very confident in, in where I'm at. And let me tell you, man, like 19 year old anorexic kid that almost killed himself to 39 year old saying confident in his skin. Yeah. You're going to tell me exercise doesn't work. Yeah. Like, are you shitting me? It's, That's 20 years of proof the, the, that the, that fucking works. The data on depression and anxiety are clear now. It shows that fitness outperforms everything. Health and fitness outperforms and everything with those. Here's how messed up it is, by the way. In the mental health space, there there's research and data now coming out on what used to be categorized as illegal psychedelic drugs for yeah. mental health. Here's why they're scared. In the This has nothing to do with health and fitness, but just to kind of highlight yeah. what I'm talking about. They all show in studies that treatments with some of these things where somebody will go in for treatment-resistant depression, will get one or two treatments and have no depression for a wow. year or two years. Yeah. That scares the shit out of the pharmaceutical industry because they're trying to figure out how they can make – how can we make money on something you take once? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Can we rework this in a way to where you take it on a regular basis? Yeah. The, the incentives are in the opposite direction. This is what we're up against. Yeah. 100%. No, it's, it's scary, man. Like it's a – a scary world we live in and uh this only reinforces the need for yes like people to get on the front lines that want to be on the front lines yes right and and what we're talking about now is more serious than finance like, we're not talking about people on the front lines to make money we're talking about people on the on the fucking front lines to save the health of humans one of my favorite things to do and we do this in, in an indirect way so full disclosure uh we do this indirectly all the time because uh, we know it's more effective but we try to teach other coaches and trainers how to sell the message yeah. effectively by selling it ourselves. Yeah. Because that's, that's, well, that's what called, you have to do. That's called leadership, bro. Mm. Like that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Like in my opinion, that's called leadership. And I think that's, you guys lead that by example. And I think that's why you guys are where you are. The staying power of this podcast is unbelievable. And, you know, listen, as, as a company that advertises here that uh, we've done, you know, events together and you guys come speak at our events, uh, when we say the name Mind Pump and the things that it represents, the there's a raving group of fans out there that cannot wait to meet you guys, to connect with you guys, to, I mean, the the Q and A that you guys did privately for us last year was packed. I mean, I we've never seen that many people come to registration because you guys were doing a Q and A, and it's like you've never sold yourselves as like come meet us. It's like we're gonna put the truth out, and people want to be around the truth, and I think that. That right there, man, it says everything. And, and I think as an industry, how do we mimic that? Yeah, yeah, I think the biggest takeaway from this conversation for all the coaches and trainers that are listening is, and, and I hear this, so I want to make sure we say it again, is that the, the market is oversaturated with bad coaches, yep. which means there's massive opportunity totally. for Huge. good people to come to space. So do not fool yourself to think that, oh, there's no room for me or there's not opportunity for me because I see all these posts i see all of these fitness people it's really a lot of people doing it the wrong way the bad way the unhealthy way the unsustainable way which means there's this massive opportunity for you to come in and we we lightly touched on it and i didn't get a chance to tell you because i actually have a couple of really good friends that own gyms or manage gyms still in 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 the space and it's at the the talent is less yeah so even though we have more knowledge, more abilities to get certified and educated and and, and easier access of, of uh, wisdom, you have uh, less qualified, less talented trainers that are out there helping our people. So if you're listening to this and wondering if I should get involved or do this because I'm, I'm passionate about it, but I'm scared because you think it's, no, it is not. You're going to crush. Yeah, there is way, there, I, I actually feel like there's more opportunity today. It's kind of like... <laughs> Uh, this is such a bad analogy, but I'll throw it out there anyway. It's kind of like politics right now. <laughs> like, you know, like there's not a very good choice. And so if, if you are somebody that wants to get into politics, it's like, now's your opportunity. Because yeah, right. nobody wants to fuck. Hence why a non-politician won. Just right. Really, right. Yeah, yeah you know exactly. Right. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, man. I mean, obviously I get to see 
I get to see so much, right? I get to see behind the scenes of so many of the businesses and I get to see the numbers, the growth and, and what people don't realize that I see is the level of coaching. And, uh, you know, you asked me earlier, businesses that I, I respect, those people create unreal results. And that's what I respect the most, man, is like, there, I know, I know coaches that will like live and die for their clients. Like I had a, this is what I've always believed to be true. When I was a coach, um, I had a client that could not get the answers she wanted from a doctor in Oregon. And I was living in Virginia at the time. And she's like, yeah, I have this doctor's opinion or doctor's appointment. I just, I don't know how it's going to go. And I was like, dope. I was like, what time is it tomorrow? She's like, it's three in the afternoon. And I was like, cool. There's a flight that'll get me in at like 11 a.m. And I boarded the flight and I flew my ass out to Oregon. Yeah. And I went to the doctor's appointment and I was like, here's the answers we need. That's it. Like, this is all I'm trying to understand for like the journey you're taking my client on. And imagine the impact you made on that client, bro. I can tell you because she went from struggling overweight her whole life to, I'm not saying I did anything magical and protocols. Like by all means I did not. Um, but I gave her the belief in herself that like, she could do this. And, and I think that, I mean, she went on to lose all the way to be very confident. She now has a family. Like it's, it's pretty wild are, like how her life turned around. We are working with people who've had lots of people give up on them. And here's the worst part. They gave up on themselves. Yep. So when they see a coach that refuses to give up, yep. that's everything right there. It is, it yep. is, man. And I think that that's like, again, I, I didn't do this. I'm so grateful for what this has given me in my, like in my life. I mean, I, I don't think that I would be experiencing life the way I experience it now without this industry. But like I say all the time, you know, I would never wish anorexia on my own worst enemy, but I made it through and I know what it's like to be at the bottom. And I believe it was placed in my life to show me and directly connect to how people are feeling that are left alone, that are at the bottom and that are, you know, lacking that light, that vision to potentially get out and, you know, I want no person left behind, man. I think that that's, that's who we have to become as an industry. No one left behind, no one not cared about, and everybody given an opportunity for success. And I'm going I'm to add one other thing, Jason, because uh, today's world's a little scary with, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better term, cancel culture yeah. or social media. We just read something from YouTube. Yeah. And so someone might be like, oh God, but I, I want to say these things, but I'm afraid they're going to, the algorithm is going to make it so that I'm not visible. And you know, that I'm, you know, if, if I say meat is healthy, yeah. then they're going to say you're harming the environment or whatever. Right. right. And I, here's what I'm going to say. You make friends and connections yep. who, with people who are like you, like we have you yep. in our corner. We have other friends in our corners. And I'll say this right now. I fucking dare you to try to shut us down because right. we'll all work together yep. and it'll be really fucking hard. 100%. And that's, and, and, and I'm, I'm encouraging coaches to work together. Yep. Don't compete with each other in the sense that you're trying to take each other down. Work together. Well, there are 9 billion fucking people in this world. Yeah. <laughs> if you think you're around. competing with each other, you are way, you're not as good as you think. Appreciate that. No, if you, yeah, if you, you you're, you look at your peers, be, be competitive with wanting to go out there and care more than anybody else. Yeah. Lead with that. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. We've gotten away from that message for a long time now in our space, when you look at the landscape and your peers, don't compare their money, don't compare to their transformation, compare like, I care more. I'm willing to get on a plane, even if there's not an ROI for it right away. And bro, I wasn't it, doing millions. Right, let me right. tell you. <laughs> let me, let me, <laughs> let me lead with that. And I promise you, I promise you, it's a slower game, but it compounds yep. and you, you'll be here still 10, 15 years later. And you'll be changing lives. Yep. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it, dude. You got it.